First of all, thanks, Nick, and all of your colleagues for organizing this event. Um, I, I'm really honored to be able to participate in this. I, I can't express that appreciation so much. Thanks to Courtney and Sonia for two great talks. Um, this, I now after, after paying close attention to Courtney's talk, I, this is, uh, I, whether or not it was planned or not, this is a really nice logical follow-up um, to Courtney's great talk. But so again, thanks for organizing this and, uh, and a greetings from very wintry Albuquerque, New Mexico and the University of New Mexico. Um, so in case I seem a little distracted over and above the current events that are going on in, in the US and the world, um, I just got an email message from my dean demanding a immediate Zoom meeting. And I said, can this wait for 40 minutes, please? So anyway, <laughs> hopefully it can. Um, those of you who like really long titles, I put those in real tiny little font, et cetera. So, and, and I'm, I'm going to, if you, if you don't mind, given that this is maybe close to one of my last talks ever, um, I, if you don't mind allowing me to indulge you with a few little happy thoughts thrown in during this talk. But at least through 2019, and for many years before that, I've been very, very fortunate to work with a number of in fascinating colleagues in a spectacular part of the world, and that is the Karoo Basin in South Africa. It's changed my perspective on a lot of things in terms of the opportunity to do so. Um, so I really, really appreciate this opportunity that I've had. And speaking of colleagues, all of them are acknowledged here, Bob Gastaldo, um, Emeritus at Colby, Johan Neveling from the Council of Geosciences in Pretoria, Sandro Camo, Cindy Loy, um, Sandra is at the University of Toronto, Cindy Loy, UC Berkeley, Anna Martini at, at Amherst, Miriam Bamford at, the, at Wits University, and Sasanda Makabulu, one of the um, um, uh, former graduate students, now a professional at uh, the Council for Ge Geosciences. So with that, I'm also going to acknowledge a few other colleagues and friends that I've met along the way and had interesting conversations with. But before I do that, here are some pictures of my dear colleagues, Sandra, Bob, Johan's back, Sasanda, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, just to acknowledge all their tremendous efforts in this collaborative endeavor. And speaking of other fun colleagues that I've had a great amount of time <clears throat> communicating with in one way, shape, or form um, of one, one form or another, but two to, two to acknowledge in particular, for those of you who ever get over to the Karoo Basin, when, when we enter a new normal for humanity, um, I strongly encourage, encourage you to go visit Ganora, where Hester and J.P. Steinberg are the hosts to their sheep farm and guest house, and also um, Batuli in the middle of the Karoo Basin, um, and visit the Royal Batuli Hotel. Your host is Anthony Hocking, who has written over 35 books on African, Southern African history, and he has a record collection of over 750,000 volumes. It may be much larger than that. I lost count. Anyway, let's move forward. And now many of you actually are on the other side of a big body of water. So if you don't, if you want, stretch your legs and go to wherever and maybe open up one of these. I chose this rack in, South, in, in uh, Pretoria's version of Costco to highlight Pinotage, a varietal that was discovered by, well, invented, if you will, by two viticulturists at Stellenbosch University in 1925. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful experiment of human ingenuity, trust me. So anyway, feel free. What do we know about the Permian-Triassic boundary? Just like Courtney was talking about in her, in her great talk, just kind of much of what you're gonna hear is something of a very similar format in terms of what we know about paleo-environmental changes um, that took place across the Permo-Triassic boundary, some of the details of the geochronology and paleomagnetism from the paleo-environmental -environment, changes 
perspective. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the marine realm, of course, but we certainly could in terms of the tremendous marine demise that took place across the boundary. We're concentrating, of course, on the terrestrial record and in the Karoo Basin for most of the Permian, not all, and in well into the Triassic, we're talking about an entirely continental uh, fluvial, in large part, sedimentologic record, maybe with a few dune aeolian de type deposits thrown in, perhaps. From a geochronologic perspective, the Permo-Triassic boundary has been the subject of a, a great deal of work. Sam Bowering and his students, the late Sam Bowering and his many students, and we, we now have a pretty good feeling that the, uh, the Permo-Triassic boundary took place at about 251.90 million years. The beginning of the extinction events a bit earlier, perhaps about 40,000 years earlier, plus or minus. Um, the, the precision associated with these determinations is quite impressive. In terms of the geomagnetic polarity time scale, a lot of workers have, have spent a considerable amount of time looking at the Permian and of course Triassic. And we now think that at least many, many reconstructions of the geomagnetic polarity time scale across now either place the PTB within a normal polarity cron or at the base of a normal polarity cron. I'll talk more about that in, uh, in a little bit um, later in the talk. And that normal polarity cron is about 700,000 years in age. Okay, um, going back to the left-hand part of this frame, just in terms of the terrestrial realm and more details to come, for it's, for it's been now well over a century that paleontologists have made the argument that the Permo-Triassic boundary is associated with a major turnover in vertebrates from what is called the Daftocephalus um, assemblage zone to the Lystrosaurus assembly, assemblage zone. And that the vast majority of the Glossopterodales, these, of course, trees, et cetera, began to disappear during this time period, if not completely disappear. Um, from Chen and Benton, this diagram illustrates um, the biodiversity changes in the marine realm, the lithologic changes in the marine ecosystem, and then highlights some of the changes in the terrestrial ecosystem at and across the Permo-Triassic boundary located here. There's a major gap in coal deposits in the very early tertiary, excuse me, very early Triassic, um, a demise in plant communities, and again, a major purportedly a major changeover in, um, in the vertebrate assemblages, the tetrapod assemblages at this time interval. And this diagram from Ritalik in GSA Bulletin in 2003 nicely highlights the purported or oft argued changeover that takes place in the vertebrate assemblages in the terrestrial realm from the Daptocephalus assemblage zone to the Lystrosaurus assemblage zone. And Rital Greg Ritalik from the University of Oregon and many other workers, um, many from South Africa, of course, have made the argument that this changeover takes place in a singular narrow stratigraphic interval at the section called the classic section near the town of Batuli. This, this narrow interval is dominated by a series of what you might describe as laminates variegated colored mudstones, um, very fine grained siltstones, clay and the like. And the long standing interpretation is that this changeover has been directly associated with the Permo-Triassic boundary as documented in the marine realm. And our, our, our evolving hypothesis that I and my colleagues assert to be more and more viable is that this changeover, this tempo, if you will, in the vertebrate realm, in the terrestrial realm, is a bit out of sync with the actual Permo-Triassic boundary in the, as documented in the marine realm. And so here's a picture of the laminates with Johan Neveling, my colleague, taking field notes and so, and so on and so on. This gives you a little bit of an idea of what some of the kinds of exposures 
are like in these rocks of uppermost Permian to lowermost uh, uh, Triassic age in this area. Um, lots and lots of gray and olive gray silt stones, as well as these kinds of laminate deposits. And while we're looking at this field image, I might as well just get to the chase and get to the punchline. You're going to soon learn that there's a complexity in, during, in terms of doing paleomagnetism and therefore magnetostratigraphy in these rocks, certainly in much of the Karoo Basin that one always needs to be concerned with and pay, pay heed to. It's, you know, it, it, it's nothing new in the sense that we've always, always for good reason, questioned the primary nature, the primary early acquired affinity for magnetizations in geologic materials, especially ones that are somewhat old. Um, so my punchline here is that based on a growing amount of data collected in the laboratory, and I should mention that everything that you're gonna see, um, yours truly is responsible for in terms of the measurements. Our overall collection in the Karoo mounts to well over 3,500 independent samples to date, hoping to get back there again sometime in the future. Um, and the, the, the growing working hypothesis is that in progressive thermal demagnetization, magnetizations that are unblocked above about 400 to 425 to 450 degrees centigrade are early acquired magnetizations. Um, and that is that they, these, the first unblocked magnetizations that we see in these rocks are probably a function of a couple of younger geologic phenomenon, as I will elaborate in just a moment or two, okay? But that's the bottom line. If we can adequately document, carefully document in the laboratory, the existence of magnetizations with laboratory unblocking temperatures well above 425, progressively either to maximum unblocking for magnetite or maximum unblocking for hematite. The working hypothesis is that those are early acquired magnetizations. So might as well get to the punchline or a punchline here. But before I do that, you're going to have to indulge me. Um, I've, I've had earlier um, forays with permo-Triassic boundary rocks. The first one is in the 1980s with Roberto Molina Garza and his, his advisor and mine, Rob Vandervoo, um, in the western part of the state east of New Mexico, whose name shall not be mentioned. And it turns out, even though at the time um, we thought these rocks were at least 8 million years older than the permo-Triassic boundary, um, because of their, uh, their relatively imprecise argon-argon and potassium-argon age determinations, turns out that the rocks that Roberto and Rob and I were sampling were deposited right across the PTB based on spectacular uranium lead results that have come out of the Berkeley lab. Thanks, Roland. Thanks, Paul and colleagues. Um, it's a spectacular section. Um, I can tell you exactly where it is. The sedimentology is beautiful. The problem is there's nothing in the way of paleontology. So a few years later, later, Roberto and I teamed up with a number of colleagues to go to Western China, Xinjiang province, that's been in the news of recent, um, where we spent several weeks sampling with our Chinese colleagues, this spectacular Dalangko River section, incredibly thick, deposited continuously or almost continuously across the Permo-Triassic boundary. It's the first time that I had been in that part of the world. So it was, a, of course, an eye-opening experience that I will never forget. And I still want to get back there. Um, lots and lots of scenes, this kind of, this road that was washed out um, just a few days before we were trying to get over to Jimsar from Arumshi kind of tells much of the story. Um, I made a lot of friends there. Here's Spencer Lucas collecting our, uh, collecting some materials, the trench that Roberto and I dug that was over a kilometer in length, the Dalanko River. Um, things, that tur things actually turned out, well, in an unexpected fashion during this foray, to the point where for almost 10 days we were in house arrest, not knowing what was going to happen to us and whether or not we'd see our dear family ever again or carry out any more paleomagnetic endeavors. 
I have to thank Ms. Golnar Sabhate, if it wasn't for her. I will not continue that, but you can read all about it in science. And here's some of the notes that I took during this time period in late summer, early fall of 1996. And again, it was quite an experience. I, and I really, really relish the chance to get back and continue the geology that spectacular part of the world. And others certainly have. Okay, back to the Karoo. So here's a really good quotation from, from Johan. I, I really like this. Even to someone familiar with it, the end Permian extinction in the Karoo, like me, it was a fresh reminder on how flimsy the evidence is and how extravagant the interpretations. Well, okay, <laughs> moving on. So you're gonna have to indulge me again because I'm trying to I'm not trying to sound like a tour guide, but this, this is important from a geologic perspective. So if you go to the Karoo and you drive a little bit north of Graf Rene, a very, very famous town in South African history and head into toward many of these great PTB sections, climbing up a little bit higher into the basin. You go by a small community, if you will, called Wellwood. Wellwood was established back in the late 1500s. And a particular family has inhabited this location um, for at least three, if not four generations. You can drive up to the main property beautiful, beautiful part of the world. And you can knock on the door and see if you can find Mrs. Rubidge. Mrs. Rubidge is married to a very famous paleontologist um, at uh, um, 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 uh, Bloemfontein University. And the Rubidge family goes back many, many decades. And Earl, um, the grandfather of the Rubidge family, worked with an individual named Broom. And they established, well, Broom was working in the early 1900s in the Karoo Basin. He's the one who first recognized this turnover in the assemblage zones. And you can, you can ask Mrs. Rubidge to go into their research facility, their museum. And this is the kind of stuff that you see. These are not Chaos. I assure you, the collection in this set of rooms has to rival any other collection in the world, if not the best. And it's just, you can spend as many hours as you want roaming through this amazing facility. Mrs. Rubidge is wonderful. And so Bob Gastaldo and I did this during our last junket to South Africa, and we were very, very happy that we did stop by. There's broom and so on. Okay, you can also go out in the field and find a lot of these um, remnants of these big odd looking creatures. And here's some examples of some of our work in one part of the Karoo. Okay, so now let's, let's get into the details here. Sorry for all of that backlog, that, that intro and humoring me. So here are two versions of the geomagnetic polarity timescale that have compiled, been compiled by different workers. Um, Surleys in 2013, who has spent a lot of time, of course, doing great work in the Germanic basin. And he argues this, these, age deter these dates that you see here are from the original Surleys 2013 um, publication. He argues that the PTB is within a, a circa 700,000 year long normal polarity cron. And here's the most recent accepted date for the Permo-Triassic boundary. All right. The Hounslow and Balabanov timescale of 2016 for much of the Permian and into the Triassic is more of a composite. Um, Surleys is of course in stratigraphic order because he's defined this entire magnetic polarity timescale in the Germanic basin. This one, on the other hand, is a bit more of a composite and places the PTB basically at the base of this long normal polarity. All right, but much of the Changshingian, the late part of the Changshingian is dominated by normal, excuse me, reverse polarity. And the early part of the Changshingian is dominated by normal polarity. All right, now here's, here's part of the kicker. Um, and as many of you know, um, 
the, um, the overall sort of plate motion history of Africa has not been terribly complicated since the late Paleozoic. These are the expected directions from 250 million years to 170 million years for a site at Batuli near the middle, this is in the free state, near the middle of the Karoo Basin. Um, the, the confidence limits of each of these expected directions are relatively small. Um, these expected directions I derived directly from the Torsvik et al. 2012 um, compilation. And this is the inclination corrected southern hemisphere coordinates apparent polar, uh, polar paleomagnetic uh, pole wander path in a global framework compiled by Torsvik. So that, of course, is one part of the problem, separating an early acquired circa 250 or so million year magnetization with something that might be a bit younger is a little bit problematic. And oh, by the way, I should mention these, of course, are normal polarity um, directions. <clears throat> Just to give you a little idea of the, the geology of the Karoo Basin, um, indeed, it's spectacular basin, younging toward the center. And of course, many of you are familiar with the, the fact that the center of the basin includes this tremendous exposure of the extrusive equivalents of the Karoo intrusive sequence, the Stormberg lavas, the Drakensberg lavas, whatever you wish to call. Two areas that we've been working in, in the um, Eastern Cape and the Free State, Lutzberg Pass area and Batuli, shown here. Um, a little bit of detail in terms of the stratigraphic section. Here's the permo triassic boundary. I just enlarge this more detailed stratigraphic section for you to show you that basically we're dealing with rocks that are part of the Beaufort group and the Balfour formation into the Catberg formation is thought to be the defining sort of transition from Permian to Triassic strata. Um, one of the hallmarks of this transition in terms of sedimentology is the presence of what are called pedogenic nodular conglomerates that indeed are conglomerates. They consist of a lot of um, rip-ups of um, uh, soil, ancient soils, pedogenic rip-ups, and lots and lots of bone fragments. In case you want to see one up close and personal, I just moistened it. All of those sub-rounded fragments, those are all um, uh, being ripped up from paleosols. Anyway, just that. Okay, now here's the bugger, the paleomagnetic geologic boogeyman. Um, unless you're an igneous petrologist. This part of the world has been, was inundated in the early Jurassic by the Karoo intrusions and the extrusive equivalents, the Drakensberg, Stormberg lavas. So this is a generalized map of the distribution of these Karoo intrusions, largely sills, uh, lacolithic complexes, you name it, a uh, number of dikes and so on and so on and so on. Um, just to give you a, a more of a vertical extent of the nature of the Karoo, um, a PhD student of mine uh, and I have been working on a core that was continuously re recovered by Shell, and Shell Oil and the Council of Geosciences a few years ago in the Western Cape. All of these red bars indicate the presence of Karoo sills within this core sequence in these Permian rocks. Pretty impressive. And just examples of what they look like in the field, sill, a feeder dike, a thick Karoo sill. Sometimes the contacts are incredibly fused. Um, and some of you may have been to this spectacular spot. This is Sani Pass in the Drakensberg Lavas in, uh, the, in Natal province. All right, so at about three this morning, I was thinking about things and, and, and woke up and said, you know, it would be really, really spectacular from a paleomagnetic perspective if somebody found a field relationship like this, where you had the Beaufort group strata folded, I don't care what geometry, underlying a major unconformity with younger Triassic strata, the Catberg and so on and so on, sitting on top with fragments of the Beaufort in the Catberg and so on and so on and so on. A great dream, maybe a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and guess what? 
Nobody has found any relationship like this to do an even better job of testing the hypothesis of the preservation of an ancient magnetization in the Permian Beaufort group, Permian to early Triassic Beaufort group, unfortunately. Oh well, one can dream. So the first place we're going to go to is Neutgedach. Um, my, my colleagues and I published the results from this section in Nature Communications last year. Um, Neutgedach is typically interpreted as Neverland, not that one in Southern California, however. Here's the Neutgedach section, a little bit close up, more PNCs, a four-legged creature for scale. And if you go in detail in the Neutgedach section, right about there, as Bob Gastaldo and I did, when we first, when the second time we visited those, this locality, first one is more recon and collecting a, a preliminary suite of samples, Bob and I stumbled across something, this faint little horizon here. And Courtney will love this, and I, I know it, and maybe, maybe perhaps many, many others of you. It just looked strange. It looked really strange and like, hmm, hadn't seen anything like this before in any of the other sections that we've sampled. In the upper part of the laminate layer, or an extensive sequence of laminates. And lo and behold, that material, about a centimeter in thickness, resulted in a spectacular uranium lead age determination. It's a pristine volcanic ash. Quite frankly, it's the first one that has ever been found in the Karoo Basin. All of the other age determinations are maximum depositional ages on, from coming from horizons that basically consist of partially reworked zircons. This one is spectacular. Um, so this result is included in that paper. Um, in the field, I was able to figure out a way to impregnate this incredibly friable stuff, made some thin sections out of it, and you can see beautiful primary depositional ash, ash uh, excuse me, textures with an abundance of primary um, igneous silicate mineral phases. In the, in the deposit. I also sampled through this horizon using a rather um, unorthodox method, but here I have to thank my, my dear friend Dennis Kent for pointing me in the right direction. He knew of a source of these spectacular ceramic boxes from colleagues in the People's Republic of China. And so what I did is as carefully as absolutely possible with non-magnetic tools, make specimens by placing upright little fragments of these mud rocks um, into, these into these ceramic cubes, always, of course, in the proper orientation, always oriented roughly toward north, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can fix them with alumina cement, and they work quite well. Um, they work really, really well. Dennis, again, thanks for the source. And so here are some examples of progressive thermal demagnetization from these rocks. I think the magnetic mineralogy is a mixture of magnetite and hematite. Um, yes, there's some dispersion here, and I, I fully admit that that's a manifestation of the sampling process, but these materials certainly can't be drilled in the field. Just a few minutes left, John. Okay, thanks. I will quickly sum up and then we can, we can talk more about other discussions. But the bottom line here is that, that the previous understanding of the transition between the DAZ and the LAZ in this area was located right here. Our age determination is much, much older than the Permo-Triassic boundary. So if this indeed is a viable transition in terms of the vertebrate turnover, it's a lot older than the PTB. And I want to skip ahead for just a minute or two, just to show as a final point and then open it up to questions. This is a study from West Lutzberg Pass. We published the results of this back in GSA Bulletin in 2018. This gives you an example of some of the sampling. Each one of these is a sample site. And I should mention that at all of these sites that we sample, at least for anywhere from seven to 10 independent samples collected. Um, typically in the West Lutzerg Pass section, you see results that are exclusively of normal polarity. 
generally very well defined up into maximum magnetite unblocking temperatures. But there are a couple of intervals that we were fortunate to sample and define where the results are a little bit more curious. You see, depending on degrees of quality, the resolution of a magnetization that is south directed or south southeast directed and steep positive in inclination. And here are some more of these. And this is what I was meaning, what I was talking about in terms of my earlier discussion when I tried to highlight an endpoint here. And that is that if you are able to see through overprints, one of which is Karoo related, through maximum unblocking temperatures of about 425 or so degrees centigrade, and thereupon isolate a subsequent magnetization, higher laboratory unblocking temperatures we think that we're looking at an earlier acquired magnetization. So these results are defining a reverse polarity magneto zone. And now just, I'll, I'll end it with this slide. I'm, I'm, I'm getting up close to out of time, but the punchline here, Sandra and I found a volcanic ash re, partially reworked in this West Lutzberg Pass section that yielded a relatively high precision uranium lead de age determination for the youngest population of zircons at 253.48 million years. My reverse polarity magneto zone is located just a little bit higher up in the section. The rest of the section is dominated by normal polarity. Here is the inferred vertebrate PTB pre, uh, inferred by previous workers. If you use the estimated sedimentation rates by previous workers for these kinds of rocks in the crew, this time interval is about 40 to 70,000 years inferred. The bottom line here is that the inferred vertebrate turnover in the PTB again in this section is considerably older than the well-documented Permo-Triassic boundary section in the marine section. And so I'll leave it at that, um, open it up to questions. Um, there's, there's a bit more to my talk in terms of further details, but the story remains pretty similar. I was going to go to the Batuli section next. So thanks for your attention um, and look forward to the rest of uh, this great event. And thanks to the organizers. Thanks, John. Nice talk and uh, some history there too. Excellent. <laughs> Do we have any uh, any questions? Or, or I know. Why, while you're thinking of questions, speaking of history, I, I meant to mention this earlier. Forgive me for doing this, but um, I confess that I've become really close Facebook friends with uh, our dear friend Brent Dalrymple. And yesterday we were going back and forth about this. I mentioned this um, this great event coming up, and I said, Brent. What do you think, what, what would it take to twist your arm to come back to New Mexico so we could tromp up Jaramillo Creek and go to Abrigo Dome? And he said, that would be wonderful. So let's hope that things start entering our, into our new normal of human history soon. And I promise to let you, let all of you know when that event will take place. Could be a lot of fun. Could be fun. I love, I love Northern New Mexico. That's where I grew up. Yeah, weren't you supposed to take us there a few years ago? I did. We did. Well, yeah, but then after that, we were supposed to go again. Oh, that's, I'm sorry. That's right. That's when I had that calamity during the field course. Shh, I'm sorry. It's okay. I had a nice time with my brother. And I got to confess, Lisa, that, that that background is watering my eyes. Yeah, me too. Hey, um, I had a question. You mentioned some dikes in your sections, and uh, you said something about being fused. What did you mean by that? Oh, okay. So the host rocks being fused by the dikes locally. And this, of course, is de entirely dependent on um, entirely dependent on the thickness of the dike. So in other words, you know, and, and I made that sweeping assertion about if you can see through 
um, an overprint with maximum laboratory on blocking temperatures. I was referring to rocks that were certainly far away from any dike contacts. So what I was gonna take you to next is this Batuli section where um, it's been sampled extensively. And one of the neat things about the Batuli section is that there's a lot of um, relatively narrow, a few, a few meters max um, Karoo dikes that are very, very well exposed in this area. And so each and every one of these dikes has had a de very detailed contact test performed on it. And again, I don't, I know I'm over time in terms of the talk, but I can just have, you know, load this up, pass it on to Nick for any perusal, or we could discuss it in the future. Um, the, the bottom line here is if you're, if you're, oh, I would say, depending on the width of the dike, if, but if the dike is a meter in width, if you're five meters away from the dike, basically you, you have removed yourself from any thermal effects. And again, keep in mind, these are really, the, in this particular locality, these are really narrow dikes. But, and, and some of you recall this from uh, a lot of the great work that was done by ca our Canadian colleagues for the longest time, they established the general argument that that the, that the thermal baking zone, the thermal annealing zone in a paleomagnetic contact test was typically the half width of a dike. That doesn't work in these particular cases. And I think I can document that pretty, pretty darn well. Um, you have to be a little bit more careful. I would, shouldn't, forgive me. Uh, you have to be a little bit more cautious. Courtney, you have a question? Yeah, I'll just ask it real quick. Um, so if that vertebrate transition isn't isn't really correlating in time with uh, the marine record, do you think it could still be caused by by uh, the Siberian traps? Because I know they have kind of a couple million year history if you combine sills and then also the volcanic output. Have you looked at at the dates for Siberian traps to see if that still correlates with where this transition might be? Yep, we indeed have. Um, and, and Courtney, I think you're absolutely right. Given the range of age determinations, maybe what we are looking at is just, just the, the init initiation that for one reason or another in the terrestrial realm um, becomes more uh, stressed you know, early on. Now, Keep in mind, though, don't forget, there's another, but in, at least for, for Karoo, um, at this point in time, there's quite an active magmatic arc in southern Gondwana. So that particular, that pristine ash and the many others that have been, that have been documented in the, in the Karoo that provide maximum depositional ages are all reflecting that, that magmatic events. So maybe there's an additional culprit here. Yeah, yeah, like a regional local effect. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, and that makes all been argued in the crew that that associated with this vertebrate transition, there is a very, very important transition in character in terms of sedimentology, like it or not. Um, interestingly, and and this is an entirely separate talk, but but and and Roland and and um, Neil Tabor from South um, Southern South, Southern Methodist University and a number of others and I are working on this from the West Texas section. If you stare at that West Texas section, which contains three, no fewer than three independent, perfectly pristine volcanic ash beds, you know all about this. You've heard it from Paul and Roland. Mm -hmm. You stare at that stratigraphy and say. This is the Permo Triassic boundary. Yeah. There's there's nothing that, in, that indicates that this was a catastrophic event in the terrestrial realm at that point in time, at least in in Western Pangaea at low latitudes. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you. Sure. <laughs>